service. This is a, what, I'm going to tell you, this is, what, let's be, have revival today, amen? Yeah. Oh, what's revival? You know, jumping, shouting, falling down. Revival is when you get the truth of God's word in you, and he revives you a little bit more, amen? And that's kind of revival I want. I would have a revival of truth that gets in me, and then I go home and say, man, I got the truth in me. A little bit more truth of God's word. You're going to have to really think today. How many got the hand up? Amen. All right, you need a hand up. You didn't get it, raise your hand. Because everyone needs this, because... Um, what I'm going to be sharing with you is uh, several years of notes that I have accumulated to write a book, and I haven't had God's permission to write the book, and uh, therefore I'm going to give you the notes of what I have um, been talking about concerning apostasy. Now a lot of people say, well, you've heard apostasy for the last six, seven, eight weeks. Well, yeah, you're going to hear more about it because we're in it. We are in it. We're right in it. We're in. If you want me to put it this way, folks, it's going to get worse. And unless you understand what apostasy is, you're going to be living in it. It's like a person who lives in a house that's full of all kinds of filth and it stinks to high heaven. How many have ever been in those homes before? You can smell it before you even get to the door. But the people who live in those homes can't smell it. You know why? Because they're used to it. And there are a lot of people who claim to be Christians that are used to being in false doctrines, false teachings. They're in apostate churches because... They don't know the difference, but you need to know the difference. Amen. All right, so we're going to talk about that again today. We are one day closer to home. Someone say amen. amen. Rapture any day. Okay, I don't believe in the rapture. That's fine. You don't need to believe in it. I do. Okay, praise God. And I believe Jesus could come at any moment. Once again, as we always teach every Sunday morning, this is our main go-to verse. This is the main thing because if God's not doing this in your life, then your Christianity is worthless as a $3 bill printed in red ink. Come on. I mean it. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm telling you the truth. This is what God wants to do in the life of the believer. Say it with me. All scripture is given by the inspiration of God. It is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. God wants to teach you the truth. That's doctrine. He wants to rebuke you when you're in sin because he loves you. He'll discipline you. Because if you're his child, that is. And he will correct you, bring you back in right uh, line with him. And he wants to instruct you in righteousness so that you can be used. You can't be used of God unless you are being instructed in righteousness. Come on. All right? All right? I get it. We, we know when we're saved, we, we get the righteousness of Christ imputed to us, like as if we never sinned. But after that, we are to be grown and becoming more like Christ. And the more we become like Christ, the more we're going to be used of God in ministry. Amen. In this church, we don't have, listen, I'm going to say it again, we don't want you to be spectators. Of course, I want you to learn today and listen and learn, but what are you doing with what Jesus has given you? Come on. If all you do is take it home and do nothing with it, then what good was it? Think about it. Come on, folks. Think about it. It's, it's like having, uh, let's say, for instance, you have all this food in your house and you couldn't eat it in 100 years and there are starving people out there and you just keep it to yourself. What good is that food? You need to get it to the people, right? You have spiritual food, you get it out to people, and you talk to them about it. Amen. Praise the Lord. That's why we are being discipled here. Amen. Praise the Lord. Would you stand for the reading of God's Word? Are you hungry for the truth of God's Word this morning? Yes. I hope you are because you're going to need to. This is a tough steak again. A lot of chewing on it. A lot of deep stuff. There are two passages of Scripture we're going to look at. I hope to get through all this today. We're going to go as quick as possible. John 14, 6, a very important passage. Jesus said to him, that's, that's Thomas, he said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, I put that in, in your handout to understand what that means. I'll touch on it a little later. The second passage of Scripture is very important, and uh, if you would look at it, Jude chapter 1, verse 4, for certain men, for certain men, say for certain men, have crept in unnoticed who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men who turned the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. This is very important because if you understand John 14, 6, you understand what the false prophets and teachers are doing that Jude writes about in Jude chapter 1, verse 4. This morning's message is identifying the fruit of true and false prophets and teachers. We want to test the spirits. It's guarding your faith against apostasy. This is part five. Amen. Father, we ask your blessing upon your word. We ask that you would help us, that you would teach us, you would lead and guide us in all truth. 
as the scriptures are being taught and, and um, rightly divided this morning and uh, the preaching and teaching, expository teaching of your word goes forth, <coughs> Lord, I ask that you would speak to our hearts and help us to understand what you're trying to say to us, that we are not in the dark when it comes to the many false prophets and teachers that are literally leading a multitude away from you and right into hell, but that we are fully aware and how to identify them concerning what you gave us about the plan of salvation. So today, Lord, we ask by the power of your spirit, open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the truth. And would you say that prayer with me right now and repeat it, say, Dear Jesus, speak to my heart this morning. Open my eyes to see and open my ears to hear. And dear Jesus, change my heart today. Amen. You may be seated. As we talk about often in our church, we live in a day where people are living in deceptions all around us. Every one of you knows someone who's deceived. They're lost, and they are completely blind to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they don't want to hear the truth. They, they literally want to believe that their way is going to get them to heaven if they believe in, in, in eternal life at all. So not only are people deceived today, but they want to live in deception. How many know that? They want to live there. They're comfortable there. It's become a norm to them. How many know that deception has become the norm and truth has become abnormal? Come on, in America especially, you see what's going on. Like I said, it wasn't like this. Go back when I was a boy. You didn't have this nonsense, this corruption, all these lies being uh, propagated like we do today. And, and it just gets sickening when I see what's going on. With the, and I, I got to refer to it. One of the greatest signs that we have reached the end, Jesus said, as in the days of Lot, so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. He says, you're going to see sexual perversion propagated and made normal. They're going to make it normal, and they're going to make those of us who say, no, that's not normal, they're going to make us to be abnormal. They're going to call evil good and good evil. And I was sitting down with my wife last night watching a, a, a movie, and, and this thing came on, uh, an advertisement for Hulu, Hulu, which is like uh, Netflix. And uh, they're, they're promoting the drag queen homosexual pride thing with all their movies they're putting on there and I just got sick to my stomach I said how many people are literally watching that garbage but there are you know how many millions of dollars it takes to produce those things where do they get the money for that there is a let me put it this way there is a, a agenda that's being forced down the throats of people and uh I mean forced. They're not saying you don't have to watch it. They're saying you've got to watch this. Because, you see, I've told you many times, and this is so important, what is it that's going to cause true Christians in America to be persecuted? It's not going to be because you go to Abundant Life Fellowship. It's going to be because what you believe concerning the homosexual lifestyle. They're going to use that against us. They're going to say, how dare you say it's wrong? It's like calling... A, a, a black person a name or a white person a name or an Asian person a name they didn't you know they were born that way you were born black white you know and of course we believe in this church there's no race come on we're all the same race some just have more more uh, melatonin in them right how many know that okay all right so how many know that but it's like someone is born um, a certain height or or, or has certain uh, issues you know, they, didn't, they can't help it. So what they're saying to us is that these people were born that way. How dare you condemn them for what, who, who they really are? And that's a lie. They weren't born that way. Okay? They weren't born that way. No more than a person is born an adulterer or a fornicator or a pedophile or any other type of sexual perversion. Come on. That's a choice. Amen? Come on. It's a choice. It's a sinful choice. And I told you that it's going to become more and more of, a, uh, of a, an issue that's going to be pushed at us over the next several years as long as Christ tarries and is coming. And it's going to come a day we're going to be threatened to the point where we, we either are going to have to deny Christ and get along with them or ex accept Christ and be totally persecuted by them. Come on. And I told you this before. They are not going to accept, accept our agenda. They're not going to accept the, the, the word of God. All right. They want us to tolerate their lifestyle, but they're not going to tolerate the Word of God. Are you getting this? Amen. I heard this, and I want to get into this before I get into the message, because 
I was reading that there are three problems that we have today in the world and in America, and especially with the young people. I'm not talking kids, I'm talking about young adults. The first no problem is that the people's attention spans today are very short, very short. You can't teach anything to them unless it's done in five minutes, right? But you know why? Because of the internet, because of, of, their, of the iPhones, you know, how many know when people get on these things, they go through things real fast? Boom, 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 I like, oh, read that, boom, 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 read. you know why? Because their attention span. Now, there's a problem with that, because how many know that God's Word is not something you're going to sit down and learn in five minutes? Come on. You go back and, and look at the book of Acts. The church met, how long did they meet when they met? For an hour? All day long. All day long. They sat and listened to Peter preach, they li listened to John preach, or any of the other apostles. And you, as we often know, Paul preached all day and all night, and a young man fell out the window. He fell asleep, so don't fall asleep in church, you know. Don't fall asleep, because you, he, he, you might fall out of your chair. He know he died. Of course, <laughs> God raised him back to life. Amen. All right, but the point is, is that back in the day, the, the, the early Christians were devoted to the apostles' doctrine. They wanted to learn. Amen. Well, you're not going to learn anything if you're, if you're in church and you say, i got to go. Come on, get this over with. I, I don't want to hear it. The second thing, the problem is, not only are people's attention span very short, now get this, they're easily offended with the truth. See, that, that, that creates even a greater problem. I want to hear what I want to hear in five minutes, and if I hear anything that I don't want to hear, I'm offended. Well, that way, there's no dialogue. There's no dialogue between what you don't agree with. Okay, I don't have a problem if you want to tell me something, and I will listen. But I, you know what? You've got to be able to listen long enough to understand what that person's saying, right? But in today's church, people say, if you don't tell me what I want to hear... I'm going to be offended, and this leads us to the problem. This leads us to the problem. Because, you know, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 10, people will be offended and will betray one another, and they will hate one another. Do we see that happening today? Oh, you better believe it. Wait till I show you this video. I hope to show you about the young man that goes into this uh, progressive church, this woke church, and he's, he's literally confronting the pastor who's been teaching that you can be gay. They're, they're celebrating Pride Month in that church. He says, what you're doing is not from God. And all he was doing was reading from his Bible. He was literally reading from his Bible. And what did they do? They grabbed him and shoved him out, literally cursing him as they were shoving him out the door, saying that they were Christians. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. True Christians don't act like that. Right. All right? They're not going to act like, first of all, they're not going to teach the lies that they're teaching. And if, and if someone disagrees with them, they're going to at least listen and have an adult conversation. Right. You see what's coming? You see what's happening? And we're going to learn what this all means. So where is this all leading to? Exactly what Paul warned us in 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. Look at this. Look at this. I want to put this up here before we get into today's teaching. 2 Timothy 4, 3 through 4. The Word of God says in, in Paul speaking to Timothy said, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will what? Who will judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. God's going to judge us, folks. He's going to judge every one of us. And how you, it's going to be what you did with Jesus Christ. Come on. What you did with the truth of God's word. He says in the next part, preach the word. Preach what word? The words of men. Preach what word? So everybody say, it. preach the what? The word of God. Preach the truth of God's word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. Why? Verse 3, he says, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. There it is. They will not endure sound doctrine. They will not endure. The endure means they don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear it because, you know what, I, if you can't prove, prove it to me in five minutes, I'm going to leave it. Endure means to stay with it and understand it, learn it, live it. Come on. They're not going to endure. Why? He says in the next part, look what he says. But after their own lust. What's that? That's their sinful desires. After their own lust. You see that? Because they have what kind of ears? Itching ears. Itching ears. Tell me something good. That's what he's saying. Tell me what I want to hear. Five minutes. Otherwise, I'm going to be offended. Tell me what I want to hear because they have itching ears. They will heap up for themselves what? Teachers. And this is what we see happening. Do you know how many people today are sitting in church are not saved because they're listening to false prophets and teachers? Right. Believe me, folks. And I, 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 I'm going to show you some things next week. I was on Rodney Howard Brown's little 
Facebook thing, and all the people are not saying, oh, I love this man because he teaches truth. They say, I love this man because when I'm in his meetings, oh, the laughter comes and the anointing's there and I'm falling. Oh, I'm looking for the power. I'm looking for this. I'm looking for that. And that's not what God wants us to look for. He wants us to look for the truth. Amen. He wants us to come to the truth, not come to some anointing or come to some miracles or that. Because, listen, the only thing that's going to save you is not if you roll around the aisle and laugh. It's going to know, the only thing that's going to save you is if you know Jesus Christ and him crucified. Someone shout amen. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned aside to fables. And that's what we see happening. And why is that? I'm going to tell you today because they don't understand three words that we're going to learn. And you need to learn these three words. You're going to learn them today. Are you with me? Yes. Well, look at verse 5. But you, turn to your neighbor and say, but you, you, be watchful in some things. Be watchful in some things. All things. I want to make sure you're paying attention. Endure afflictions. Oh, that don't sound like something Christians should have to endure. Endure afflictions. You better believe they're coming. You stand up for Jesus. You live for Jesus. You're going to be persecuted. That's so clearly taught in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. All who desire to live righteous in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Are you with me? Now, you, this is kind of stuff that people don't want to come here. Oh, Pastor Dave, you teach that stuff. I'm not coming back to church. I want to go to a church that tells me only positive things. Well, and that means about three-fourths of this word you're never going to be able to study. You're going to have to throw it aside. Come on. Are you getting it today? And I'm not teaching this stuff to, to, to offend you or make you afraid or anything. I'm trying to get the truth in you because it's only the truth that you and I are going to be able to stand for him. Amen. Do the work of an evangelist. Preach the true gospel. An evangelist preaches Christ and him crucified. Right. It's all about Jesus Christ and him crucified. Right. Right. Fulfill your ministry. Are you with me today? Now, I say all that as introduction because as we have been uh, learning, are you ready to learn? What have we learned? Praise the Lord. Turn your name and say, what have we learned? Well, the vital truth. This is our vital truth. It's, we've been talking about this for months. This is where this whole teaching is based on. Because we are living in the last di days, the Antichrist spirit is rising up in the world. Boy, is it rising. Yeah. It's been let off the hook. It's rising. Antichrist, as we've learned, means to be against Christ and in replace of Christ. So we see there's a lot of things that are being said that are against Christ, against God's word. When I say against Christ, it means against God's word, as well as replacing Christ with a false Jesus or false uh, messiahs. Are you getting it? Apostasy is increasing worldwide. Churches are falling away from the truth. Even good, sound, biblical do uh, doctrine teaching churches like the Southern Baptist Convention, can you believe it? Turning away from the Lord. Turning away from the Lord, becoming woke. How does this happen? Because, once again, we have people in the church that are man-pleasers, not God-pleasers. Come on. True biblical Christianity is declining, and it is being replaced with a false form of Christianity that has rejected Jesus Christ as Lord. And let me tell you, how many of you see this happening? Come on. I know some of you come on Wednesday night and say, I see this happening. I, you know, this, this church, this, this pastor is teaching this nonsense. What's going on? Because pastors today are more concerned about bringing people in the church, making, getting a crowd, getting paid more money to pad their wallets than they are to tell the truth to bring people to Christ. Therefore, a multitude of false professing Christians will, not might, they will join with the world's religions to welcome and worship the Antichrist as God that is so clearly taught in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Read it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Read it. Chapter, verse 1 all the way to verse 12. Paul says they will be given over to the great deception because they didn't receive a love for the truth. Now we talked about that many times. I think those of you who have been coming to church here know that. So apostasy is declining Christianity. Here we go. Very quick, in the next 45 minutes, how do we as Christians keep ourselves from falling away from Christ and joining the ranks to the apostates? I gave you some very good points so far, but first of all, as believers in Christ, we must, turn to your neighbor and say, we must. You must learn how to guard your faith against apostasy. How do you do that? Your faith is so important, what you believe. That's what I'm talking about. What do you really believe about Jesus Christ? What do you really believe about salvation? You must look to God's holy word because only th by standing firm on God's holy word will you be able to st stand strong in Christ daily. Amen. To do this, if you can go to the next one, we must have spiritual discernment. Now, you and I can't do that without the help of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit 
teaches us truth. He will sound the alarms when you are around someone who's teaching something that is false. You say, wait a minute, that's not what God's Word teaches. I know that. The alarms will go off. I happen to happen to me all the time. Okay? And that's why I'm very careful who I listen to because I was watching a guy not too long ago. I told you about him. He was teaching on, and of course, his whole ministry is about God's blessings. If you are not walking in total victory, if you are not walking in blessings and prosperity, and if God's not doing all these things in your life, you're, if you're not a success, you don't have enough faith. <laughs> well, you know what? In America, that may work a little bit. But try that, like I've said, try that in these third world countries. There are Christians there that are very poor. Try that in North Korea. Go up to Kim Jong-un, whatever his name is, said, I'm, I want, I'm going to be walking victory right now. I'm a Christian. Give me a job. Right. They'll give you prison. Right. Are you hearing me? Yeah. The true gospel works in every nation on the earth. The false gospel does not. Come on. Are you with me? So we need to understand what spiritual discernment is. Someone shout amen. That's why 1 Thessalonians 5, 21 says, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Test everything. Even test what I'm about to tell you today. Are you going to test me? You better believe it. Test me. This was our verse for the last two weeks. We're not going to uh, cover it because when you see these, these slides, if you can go to the next one, if you see these slides like this when they're just one slide, that's because we've already covered it and I'm not going to do a lot of teaching on it. I'm just going to highlight it. Remember what Jesus said in John chapter, or excuse me, Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 to 20. Beware of what? False prophets. How are they coming? They're coming to you in sheep's clothing. They're coming looking like Christians. They're carrying Bibles. They come to church, say amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. They speak all the Christian lingo. But inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Ravenous means hungry. What are they hungry for? They're hungry for your money. That's, you're going to find out 90% of it is all about power, prestige, and money. I want your money. And that's what Peter said in 2 Peter chapter 2. We've already read that. You will know them by their what? Fruits. And that's what we're covering. How do you identify these people? You will know them by their fruits. And Jesus said, if you can know them by their fruits, guess what? You can know them by their fruits. Amen? How many agree with that? If Jesus said, I can know them by their fruits, I can know them by their fruits. But we must understand what those fruits are. Are you with me? Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown in the fire. Jesus is saying, these people aren't saved. They're lost. No Good tree is going to be cut down thrown a fire. These are bad trees, as we learned. Therefore, by their fruits, you will know them. All right, we're going to take off from here. Are you ready? <clears throat> so we're picking up where we left off last week. Now, if you weren't here last week, I really encourage you to go on YouTube or Rumble and watch last two week's messages, please, because it'll help you understand. Because I told you when we started this, this was not going to be a one or two or three Sunday teaching. It was going to be several Sundays because I'm adding layers. So we're kind of building on what we talked about last time. Are you with me? All right. So last week we talked about the good fruit and the bad fruit, right? Which one of those up there do you want to eat? Which one of those you, would you love to have a basket full? Oh, of course, you'd want the good fruit. It's like I said last week, we, we go to the store, we look at the fruit, we check it out, make sure there's no holes in them, no worm holes, no, no, um, they're not bruised, they're good, solid fruit, and we put them in our, our, our grocery cart. If you found something that looked like the fruit on the right side, you would say, no, I'm not going to take that. I'm gonna, in fact, I'll go to the manager and say, how dare you put that kind of garbage out? What do you think I am, pig? You know, right. You know, and and uh, good grocery stores have someone walking around all the time checking that stuff and say, oh, boy, I've got to take that and throw that out because I don't want any customers to see that, right? So if you're going to examine the physical fruit that you purchase at a grocery store, how much more should you examine this spiritual fruit that is being served up. Come on, all right? Amen? Are you with me today? Are you with me today? All right? Because I want you guys to learn this. If you learn this, it, it's easy to identify what is true in false teachings. Here we go. So last week we talked about this in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15 through 23. Jesus told us that we can identify both the true and false prophets and teachers by their fruit. Jesus said there's good trees and there's bad trees. The good tree produces good fruit. The bad tree produces bad fruit. Are you with me? So the question is, what are the fruit we are to be examining on a continual basis to know if we are being taught by true or false prophets and teachers? Well, I told you last week, the first thing you've got to look at is the fruit of their character. All right? Do they exhibit a sanctified lifestyle of Holy Spirit fruit? Are they producing righteousness? Or do they exhibit a lawless lifestyle? Do they live for the world? Do they live for money? 
Are they just like the world? It's one or the other. Now, this one is a little bit hard because, as you well know, most of these people, these false prophets and teachers are on television, right? And we're not around them. We don't see how they're living. We might be told. So the main thing is that we don't just examine the fruit of their character. The main thing is, number two, we examine the fruit of their teaching. That's the main thing, and that's what we're going to spend a lot of time on, right? I can't tell you how, uh, um, you know, different ones that are, are these false prophets, teachers, how they live, what's going on at home. I, I'm not there, okay? But I can clearly examine what they're putting out there, what they're teaching. So we want to examine the fruit of their teaching. Now, does their teaching, here it is, this is so key, does their teaching lead people to Jesus Christ for salvation? No. All right, that's the question. The true man or woman of God will, but the false prophet may talk about salvation, but they're not talking about the same Jesus, and they're not talking about the same salvation that's in the Bible. Come on. That's why Paul warned against a different gospel. Come on, are you getting it? What do you say? If anyone brings a different gospel to you other than what we brought, even an angel preaches it. Anyone, let them be accursed or anathema. means cursed right to hell. That's how serious it is. And that's why Paul and Peter and John and Jude and Jesus and, and all the way through the New Testament, I told you, how many times has God's word warned of false prophets and teachers? Many times, right? Why would God tell us this if we are not to examine their fruit, right? But yet, how many people today understand who they really are? I showed you many verses in the Bible, and yet I guarantee you the vast majority of churchgoers don't have a clue who they are. Oh, I don't like that preacher. He must be a false teacher. Why? Well, because he preaches on sin, and that bothers me, so I don't like him. He's a false. No, that's... Oh, I like this guy because he tells me that God wants to make me rich and bless me. That, he's got to be true. See, there, see how deceived people are? It's the exact opposite. Because... The true man or woman of God is going to lead people to do three things, and we're going to look at those in just a moment. Does it lead people to seek Jesus to get salvation, or do they lead people to Jesus to get what they want? Right? Are you seeing it? All right, so here we go. Good fruit, Holy Spirit. Last week we talked about this. What is the good fruit? Good fruit is the fruit of the Holy Spirit, which is what? What is it? It's called, everybody say it. It's right up there. What does it say? righteousness, righteous living, all right, righteous living, it's going to transform your life, that is a continual, uh, it, it's going to continually produce in the true Christian's life who is being transformed by abiding in the truth of God's holy word, now how does that happen, well we're, as we we're going to learn, the true believer is saved, and if the true believer is saved, the Holy Spirit resides in them, and so the Holy Spirit leads and guides them in some truth, all truth. All right? Remember again, a good tree is going to produce good fruit. Why? Because a good tree has been justified by Jesus Christ. And therefore, that person is going to be sanctified as we're going to learn. Are you with me? So that's clearly taught in Galatians 5, 22 through 23. Now, Jesus said in John 15, 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. When I says vine there, the vine was the big part of the grape. The branches were the little parts. He's, he who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. There it is. If we are abiding in Christ, that means his words are getting in us, they're going to transform our life. And praise God, it's, he's doing that. Amen. Those of you who are here this morning, talk, Ken talked about that. How over the years, he, he becomes more and more hungry for the word of God. How's that happen? Because the Holy Spirit's doing the work in us. He who has begun a good work in you will what? Completed until the day of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit's doing the work. Amen. That's how you know you're saved. Listen, you know you're saved because you want to follow Christ. Now, that doesn't mean you always will, but it means you want to, right? You desire to. Someone shout amen in the house of God this morning. But let's go to the bad fruit. We talked about this last week. Bad fruit. That's the flesh. Amen. Bad fruit is simply living like you always lived. Bad fruit is the works of the flesh, lawlessness, continually produced in the life of the false Christian who is never saved, who does not abide in the truth of God's holy word because they're not saved. That's it. Oh, they'll go to church. They'll say they're saved, and there are far more of them than there are that are truly saved. But they'll go to church on Sunday. They'll sing songs about Jesus. They'll raise their hands, clap their hands. They may even give good offerings. But once they get out of church, they go right back in that world and live just like the rest of the world. Come on. It's getting awful quiet in here. Amen. All right. Now, don't make me preach longer than I'm, I'm intending to. 
Because unless I understand you here, I'm going to have to repeat myself, and I don't want to do that. Come on. Do you, does everybody get this so far? In fact, Ken, if you want to grab this microphone, anybody has any questions, you know what, I w I'm here to teach you. I'm not here just to preach a message and say, okay, I hope you got it. I want to know you got it. All right, so this is last week. Now, this is clearly taught in Galatians chapter 5, 19 through 21, the works of the flesh. Anyone who lives like this, the Word of God says, will what? They will not inherit the kingdom of God. Also taught in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 and 10. All right, amen? Now, we know this because, remember, Jesus said, if you abide in me and I in you, will produce much fruit. What happens to the branch that doesn't produce fruit? John 15, 6. Right after Jesus said, those who abide in me will produce much fruit, what's he say? If anyone does not abide in me, if anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch. And what, what happens to him? He dries up. His spiritual life is just dry and dead. Oh, they may be lively in church. They may jump and shout and praise the Lord, all that stuff. But that's not fruit. That's emotionalism. Come on. Please don't equate, I'm excited about Jesus. Most people get excited about Jesus and, and, and who are, are false Christians because of what Jesus can do for them. Listen, folks, you should be excited about Jesus because what he's already done for you. He saved you. Amen. Can I get an amen in the house of God? I don't look for Jesus to do, you know, he, if, he, if he blesses me with anything, praise God. But that's not why I serve him. I serve him because of who he is. He's King of kings and Lord of lords. He's my Savior. Can I have an amen today? Amen. Yes, give the Lord a praise offering. And Jesus says they are dried up and they gather them and cast them in the fire and they are burned. Of course, he's talking about eternal destruction. And we left off on this last week in Hebrews 12, 14. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. And that's, that's, that's clear. Well, wait a minute. I'm not perfect. Jesus didn't say you had to be perfect. Holiness means separated. That doesn't mean, see, we often equate holiness as someone walks around and they have this halo and they never do anything wrong. That's not holiness. Holiness means you are separated unto God. That's it. It's sanctification. Now, we're going to talk about that a little later next week, I hope. Sanctification. The Lord is sanctifying you. What's he do? He, the word of God causes you to leave the world little by little unto Christ. Amen. Does everybody understand that? Right? Now, a lot of this stuff is Christianity 101, but much of the church is ignorant of it because it's not being taught like it should. Praise the Lord. Now, let's look at Jude chapter 1. Uh, we looked at the verse 4, but here it is. You're not going to become holy. You're not going to become sanctified unless you're saved. Come on. You, you're not going to have the Holy Spirit working in you unless you've saved. Now, look what Jude writes. Beloved, I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. There is only one salvation. Amen. As you're going to learn, Jesus is the only what? Way. There are many ways. I heard Oprah Winfrey say it on her show. Oh, there's got to be more than one way. You know, there are all kinds of ways to heaven. And I watch people applaud this woman who is ignorant of God's word. No, there is not many ways. It's only through Christ and him crucified can you and I be saved. All right, so... Judah saying there's only one common salvation among the whole church. I found it necessary to uh, write you, to exhorting you to contend. Contend there means literally to fight. Fight to keep the faith. Amen. To contend earnestly for the faith which was once and for all delivered to the saints. And by the way, let me just say this to you, brother and sister. When this book, the last book, was added to the canon of Scripture, our faith is found in here. It's not found in these extra books. It's not found in the, in the Book of Mormon. It's not found in, in any other book that's written by men. Come on. It's only the Bible. We go to the Word of God. Amen. Amen. These other books that so-called teach truth, like the Shack, that book is the most diabolical and the most blasphemous book. But people, oh, I love it. But it's not teaching the truth. Come on. That's why we... But there are churches that teach out of it. Please don't do that. We don't need... Any teaching that's being done, anything that we produce as, as handouts or any Bible studies must be supported by the Scriptures, all right? Are you getting it? Then we have something, but once again, we must go back to God's Word. And it was once and for all what? Read it with me. Delivered to the saints. Amen. Once and for all. There is nothing else to be added, right? Now look at verse 4. We already looked at this. Very quick. For certain men have crept in what? That's how Satan works. Oh, he comes in like a snake slithering in. I've had snakes in my house before. 
You leave a little crack in the door and they'll slither in. You don't know this until one day you're looking down. There it is right there. <laughs> Shocks you. How do you get in here? Well, these men have crept in where? Into the church unnoticed. Now, who are they? The Word of God says they were long ago marked out for this condemnation. What's the condemnation? The condemnation is that they are hellbound. And you've got to read the whole chapter. I'm not going to read it all. Who are they? They're ungodly men. They're not saved. They're not men of righteousness or women of righteousness because they turn the grace of our God into what? Lewdness or lasciviousness. That means willful sin. In other words, they literally teach a different gospel. Are you getting it? And not only do they do that, but they do so because who do they deny? They deny the who? Read it with me. And they deny the who? The only Lord God and uh, the only Lord God in our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, they deny who Jesus is. They teach a different Jesus. So here we go. How can we clearly identify the fruit of both true and false prophets and teachers? If you remember these two things, it will help you. Number one, here it goes. Well, this is the answer. It depends on what they teach concerning who Jesus is and how salvation is obtained for sinful men. That's where it starts. If they got that wrong, everything else is going to be wrong. Come on. How many know if you start off on the wrong road and you keep going, you're not getting to where you want to go, right? These people are on the wrong track right from the beginning. But yet they're leading a multitude away from Christ. And that's why Jesus said, now get this, Matthew chapter 7, you know the verse. In fact, you can quote it with me. Matthew 7, verse 12, what's Jesus say? Wide is the, or Matthew chapter 7, seven verse 13. Wide is the gate, broad is the road that leadeth to where? Destruction. And only a few go there, right? Many go that way. That's all the false religions. That's all the false Christian movements. Many go that way. Jesus said, narrow is the gate, difficult is the way that leadeth to life, and very few find it. Why? Why are very few finding it? Because as you have learned, only those who repent of their sins, deny themselves and take up their cross and want to follow Jesus right. are going to seek truth. Why? By the way, let me ask you this. Boy, this is a good question. Do you study God's word? Yeah. Who here says God? What are you trying to find? For, but for so you can get more from God learn how you can be more prosperous how you can be more blessed why in the world would anybody study this book you do so if you're truly saved because you want to serve Christ you do so because you want to serve Christ you want to honor him amen otherwise what do you this this book is is useless to you come on are you getting it today you love Jesus and you want to serve him. So to get to know him, you study his word. So he is Lord of your life. Amen. He transforms you. The Holy Spirit will do that. Now, let's go back to what we're, what we're looking at. Let's go to the next one. These are the three words. Get them down. The three words that will help you identify false prophets teachers are justification, sanctification, and glorification. Notice they're all gifts. Who do they come from? Who do they come from? They come from God. God. God gives them to them. These are gifts that God gives us. Everything that God does concerning salvation, get this now, He does for us. You and I cannot, you know, those gifts up there, how many give yourself a gift on birthday, on your birthday? No. no wrap it up and everything? No. These are gifts from God. So salvation is 100% by God. Can I have an amen? Are you listening? There's nothing you and I can do but other than believe. That's it. Even when you study the truth of God's word, you believe it. Yeah. All right? And if you truly believe it, you're going to practice it. Amen. Amen. Amen? All right, so these three words, justification, sanctification, glorification. Now, here it is. Next one. To identify the, true, the fruit of the uh, true and false prophets and teachers, we must know and understand what the one true gospel of Jesus Christ is. People ask me, well, what's, well what is the truth then? What is the one true gospel? Because there's many false gospels. Paul dealt with it. The one true gospel is this. It is sound doctrine. What does the word of God say in 2 Timothy 3? For, for all scripture is given by what? The inspiration of God for what? Doctrine. Sound doctrine. All the Bible. So it's sound doctrine from God's holy word that the Holy Spirit uses that brings about salvation by these three things. And it happens just like this. Number one, everybody read it with me. Justification by faith that saves the sinner. 
Justification. Here's a, here's a little phrase that you can remember. Justification means just as if you never sinned. God treats you just as if you never sinned. Justification by faith that saves the sinner. How many know we're all sinners? Yeah. Come on, are you with me so far? Yeah. You're getting it? Number two, sanctification follows this. Sanctification, that's truth that transforms the believer. Now you're not ju a, 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 just a sinner. You are a saved believer. Come on. And if you're a saved believer, then God's going to transform your life by the truth of God's word, right? Amen. Praise God. You're becoming more like Christ. That's what Romans 12, 1 and 2 is about. That's what Romans 8, 29 and 30 is about. Praise God. Number three. Everybody say number three. Which leads to glorification. That means the eternal perfection as joint heirs with Christ. That glorifies God. How many know we're joint heirs with Christ? And one day we will be with him forever. We'll be just like him. 1 John 3, 2. You know, uh, when we see him, we shall be like him. That happens when we get our glorified bodies. Amen. How many are looking for that day? And boy, I'm, I'm excited about that. Amen. Come on. Think about it. Boy, that's going to, when my wife is looking forward to that, when she has no more pain in her body, you will never have pain. You will never have suffering. You'll never know what it means to be tired or weak. Amen. Because you'll have a perfect body. Now, if you don't have justification, you're certainly not going to get sanctification. And if you don't have sanctification, you're never going to be with God in eternal glory. So guess which one Satan's going to attack most? Which one? Which one? Justification. He doesn't want anybody to come to the Lord. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, and I'm, I don't have the, the, the scripture up there, but you know what it says. Satan hath blinded the minds of, who? the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who believe not the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. The light. The light. Jesus is the light. He is the way, the truth, and light. Amen. Are you with me? So he blinds people from seeing the truth. They may believe in some religion or they may follow some Jesus or some gospel, but they're not following the gospel, which we're about to teach. Amen. All right. Are you with me? So let's go to back to our good fruit. Here it is. Good fruit. Good fruit begins. That's the Holy Spirit fruit comes about by the truth of God's holy word concerning Jesus Christ that brings justification to the lost sinner. Number two, sanctification to the saved believer. And number three, eventually glorification that is eternal life for those who are Christ. Amen. All right. Does everybody understand that? Now, all throughout the word of God, these, these terms are taught. And you've got to have all three for salvation. Okay. Amen. So let's look at this chart. Now, in your handout, I gave you this. All right. On the back page or next to the last page. Here it is. If you understand this, you'll understand what God wants us to know and learn and what to avoid. Justification, that means Christ redeemed us. Where did he do that at? At the cross. Who was it that hung on that cross and suffered? Was it just a man, an angel, as Jehovah's Witness today? He was just a man like uh, uh, the, the Word of Faith people teach in the New Apostolic Reformation. Uh, Bill Johnson out there in, in, in Redding, California said Jesus was just a man. He wasn't God. Who hung on that cross? Who hung on that cross? His name was Jesus, but who was on that cross? God. God hung on that cross. He was fully God and fully man. He always was God. He never stopped being God. You can't stop be God, being God and be God. Come on. He was always God. He just came in human form. All right, do you get it? He set aside his divine prerogatives as a man. That's why he could die. Are you getting it? So Jesus redeemed us that from past by suffering God's wrath on the cross. That's past tense. Amen. If you are saved, you've been redeemed. Amen. Oh, come on, right? Does everybody get this? All right, so we have been saved from what? The penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? What kind of death? Hell. Eternal death. Not just death. We're all going to die if Jesus tarries. Physically, we're going to die. He's talking about eternal death. Hell. This is a one-time experience. We get saved. We're truly saved. And that means our position in God is that we are now perfect in God's eyes. Come on. Because Christ, who paid the price for us, we are positionally in God. Amen. This is the work that God has. God works for us. He's already done this. Amen. So we are in God's eyes. We are perfect in this life. Do you see that? God looks at you and says, um, um, Kathy, I don't see the sin anymore. I see Jesus. I see Jesus. You see, that if you have accepted Christ as your Savior, He doesn't see you, your sin. He sees Jesus, who paid the price for your sin. 
on the cross. Remember, it wasn't just Jesus dying a painful death. He took God's wrath on the cross. He took your punishment and mine. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us. Amen. Amen. Is that exciting? Now, when you understand that, that does something to your heart. Especially when you realize that God could have easily said, you're not worth saving, I'm going to let you go to hell forever. But he didn't. And that's why it's so important to understand what justification is. Amen. After you're saved comes sanctification. Sanctification is the Holy Spirit transforming us. Why? Because God has a plan for your life. He doesn't want you just to go home and say, I, I'm saved. He doesn't just want you to go to church and learn. He wants to use you for his glory. And part of that is he wants you to become his disciple, Christ's disciple, so you can tell others about Jesus. Amen. Amen. People need the Lord. Amen? Amen. And they're not going to know the Lord if people in the church aren't willing to testify and witness for his glory. Amen. So the Holy Spirit transforms us. That is taking place every day. And that's if you're right now, if you are listening to God's word, if you're listening right now, and you're taking the word in, guess what's happening? God's transforming you through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit. Get it? Because he's the teacher. I may, I may be teaching, but guess who's really teaching you? The Holy Spirit. He's making everything that's on God, uh, up there on God's word real to your life. Oh, how many have ever just opened the word of God and you've looked at a verse many times and one day it just, boom, it jumps off the page at you? Right. There. Who, well, who did that? Holy Spirit. Why? Because God knew you were ready to understand that. He doesn't take us overnight, okay? Just like, you know, a, a, a rocket scientist doesn't become one overnight, you know? Just because a child plays with rockets when he's in first grade doesn't mean he's ready to build big rockets when he's in second grade, all right? He has to learn through time, amen? That's the same with Christianity. You can live to be a million years old and ne never fully come to understand all God's word. That's how deep it is, amen? So the, tr the transforming power of the Holy Spirit. We're being saved from the power of sin. Before we are, we're saved from the penalty of sin, hell. Now we're being saved from a lifestyle of sin. Praise God. A true believer doesn't live like they did before they are, were saved, right? You get that? How many know that today? And we talk about it all the time. That's why you're, you're going to repent of all uh, the sexual perversions and all the other things you did. You're going to repent of it. And, and this is why when the, you get around these people that say, oh, you can be a homosexual and be a, saved. No. no. It goes against what God teaches in Genesis chapter 1, that God created man and woman, male and female. To what? To do what? To populate the world. Two men can't do that. Two women can't do that. And besides, it's, it, the sexual lifestyle of, um, of homosexuals, especially the males, is very dirty and it, it is absolutely perverted. Come on. Oh, Pastor Dave, you're, you're going to offend people. Yeah, I'm going to offend you because I am going to preach God's word. And if you don't want to hear, listen, I'm tired of people saying, oh, you're going to offend them. You're going to offend them. You're going to offend them. Get, if I, if, you know what? If, if I'm worried about offending people, I'd have to throw this away. Because I, you know, sometimes I even offend myself. Come on. But I'm going to preach God's word. We're being saved from the power of sin. Now, this is a lifelong experience from the time you come to know Jesus Christ as Savior to the day Jesus calls you home by either death or rapture. It's God working in us, the Holy Spirit. You're not perfect in this life. I get it. We're not going to be perfect. Remember, God sees us as perfect. Otherwise, we couldn't be saved. But we're becoming more like Jesus. Amen? And finally, the last word, glorification. We are fully like Christ. 1 John 3, 2. When we see him, we shall be like him. Remember? We are Christ's church, the bride of Christ. When we're with him in heaven, what's the Bible say? That we get garments of white. What are they? They're the marriage garments. What are they? These are the righteous acts of the saints. The Lord puts those on us because we are now just like Jesus. Someone shout amen. amen. Praise the Lord. He's the first fruits from among the dead. Praise God. So this is a future event. We will all be saved from the presence of sin. And how many are looking forward to that? Praise God. I'm looking forward to it. You know, hey, listen, think about this. No more of this liberal corruption stuff that's being shoved down our throats. Amen. And also, no more of these, listen, corrupt Republicans too. Come on. No more corruption, period. When Jesus rules and reigns on this earth, we will be completely away from the presence of sin. Amen. And that's our eternal experience. Now, if you don't understand this, folks, this is so powerful. Think about it. Never again, never again will you and I have to deal 
with our problems in our own life, problems with people, problems with corruption and wickedness, never again. We will be in perfection. And that's why the Bible says, I have not seen, neither ear heard, neither has it entered in the hearts of men the things that God has prepared for them that love him. Amen. Oh, boy, we got a treat waiting for us. Amen. And I don't think we can fully understand on this side of eternity what that looks like, but we will one day. Amen. Now, why is this all important? Because this is God's final work in us. This is where God is ultimately glorified in us. It's, it's, we're perfected in the next life. God's work in us. Now, I also put it on the next one. If you can look at that, but I'm not going to spend much time. But this is exactly what it is. The three phases of salvation. We have been saved, justified by what? Faith. We are being saved, sanctification. We're saved from the uh, consequences of sin, justification. We are being saved from the lifestyle of sin, sanctification. We will be saved for all eternity. We'll never, ever, ever be able to lose our salvation. When you're with Christ, you won't be able to even think one sin. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's wonderful, isn't it? Now, why is this all important? Here we go. Give me 10 more minutes, maybe 15. Is it okay? <laughs> is it getting hot in here? All right. Here we go. I want to talk about this because we know what the true fruit is. The true fruit, justification, sanctification, and glorification gets in us. We know, understand God's word, what's going on. But here's the bad fruit. Now get this. Comes about by rejecting the truth of God's holy word concerning who Jesus Christ is. That's where it all begins. Who is Jesus? The false prophet and teacher points to a different Jesus. And this brings about apostasy. This brings about people falling away from Christ or never coming to Christ. So there's no justification for the sinner. You're lost. And if there's no justification, there's no Holy Spirit working, so there's no sanctification, but instead you're going to have lawlessness. What did Jesus say? Remember he said in Matthew 7, verse 23, Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Oh, they came with all kinds of things they did. Lord, Lord, did we not do this? Do we not do that? Jesus said, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. Why? There was no sanctification. Why? There was no justification. See, and those are, those are most important too. Eventually, for these people, it's damnation or eternal death. Not glorification, damnation in hell for those who are not in Christ. Amen? And the scariest words in all existence, depart from me, I never knew you. When you hear those words, folks, it's over. It's over, and that's the thing we must understand. You'll never get another chance. That's why you want to get it right now, amen? So let's look at Jesus said in John 14, 6. Here we go. This is it. Remember what's going on here. Jesus is getting ready to depart. He just told his disciples that he's going away to prepare a place for them. We love that verse, right? right. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would tell you so. If you believe in God, believe also in me. I go to prepare a place for you, remember? Yeah. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back and, and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. That is a rapture verse, amen? Those who teach there's no rapture don't understand what Jesus is saying there. Then he, Thomas says, well, where are you going? Jesus, I'm going to prepare a place, but where are you going? I don't understand, Jesus. And Jesus said, okay. This is what he said to Thomas. Look at this. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way. Remember what Jesus was saying. He's going to the Father. He's going to the Father. To prepare the house for the believers, right? So he's saying, if you're going to be able to go to the Father as I'm going, Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Now, what does this mean? Jesus is saying, you can't come to the Father. You can't have eternal life unless I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Notice, it's all about Jesus. Amen? Turn your neighbor. It's all about Jesus now. He does it all. He must be the way, he must be the truth, and he must be the life. Now, to understand this, as we identify the fruits of false prophets and teachers, let's look at this. The basic gospel outline, I want you to see this, is focuses on Jesus, always. Never on you and I. The only thing that focuses on us, we are sinners. I heard this false teacher I was telling you about. They love to take things in the Old Testament and take it out of context and make it about us. Here's a good example. You know, David, he ran to the battle. He ran to the battle to defeat Goliath. And he took with him three stones. He didn't even get that right. The reason why he took three stones is Goliath had two brothers. All right? And they were, they were Nephilim too. Of course, he said, you know, he, he took three stones. It represents the... Uh, 
spirit or something. I don't know. It was just way off base. But here's the thing he said. Now, God told David he could beat Goliath. Now, God tell, is telling us we can beat our Goliaths. That's not what that teaches at all. Who does David represent here? Jesus. Everything in that verse is Jesus. Jesus defeats sin. Jesus, everything is about Christ. It's not about us. You're, you're, oh, if you go out and have enough faith, you can defeat your Goliaths in life, your Goliath of poverty, your Goliath of sickness, your Goliath of failure, your Goliath of depression. That is a bunch of hooey. Where in Scripture do you get that? All right, I got news for you. Listen to me. If you have Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, let me tell you something. You have the final victory. You don't have to go out and claim your victory. Come on. Are you getting it today? But those who teach this nonsense always make it about us when it has to be about Jesus. So the true gospel focuses on who? With me. Jesus. And there are three things. Why do we need Jesus? Because we need more money, right? This is what I'm hearing from a lot of these people on TV. We need a better life. We need a best life, right? What did Jesus do for us? Did he come to us to say, I'm going to come and promise you prosperity or, you know, I, oh, you need success. You're just not successful enough, smart enough. No. What did Jesus do for us? I'm going to ask you. Come on, say it with me. He suffered on the cross for our sins. Come on. And how are we reconciled to God through Jesus? How are we reconciled? By doing good works. Come on, I need to hear from you. Are you this is why you need to hear. How are we reconciled? Through what? By faith. By faith are we saved. Through God's grace. Amen. Now, Let's look at the good fruit of the Holy Spirit. This is the true gospel. I already showed you some things that are being taught, a false gospel. Are you with me so far? The true gospel begins with the truth of God's holy word. That's it. By, by the way, God's word is true 100%. It's not the, the problem is not God's word. The problem is those who preach and teach it. They corrupt it. They twist it out of, out of, out of, out of context. I've told you many times. The reason why we have a lot of false prophets and teachers today is because they'll take one verse and make a major teaching on it instead of looking at the verses before and after. What is the key ver words? We say it all the time. Context, context, and context. You understand. It begins with the truth of God's holy word concerning who Jesus Christ is and what he accomplished on the cross. That brings about justification to the lost sinner. You see that? And I put it in your notes. It's so important. Get this down. I'm going to read it to you because if you understand this, you're going to say, okay, I heard this guy preach and teach us. This had nothing to do about what Christ did for me on the cross. Instead, he's teaching something that's all about what the world seeks after. You know what I'm talking about? What the world wants. To identify the fruit of true and false prophets and teachers, we must know and understand what is justification. What is justification? Come on. See, the, 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 the church is ignorant. I'm not saying you are, but I'm saying most of the church doesn't understand. We see those words in Scripture, but we don't understand what it means. These words are deep, and they have a lot of meaning. Okay, the teaching of justification by faith is what separates true biblical Christianity from all other false belief systems. That's what makes the true man and woman of God from all the false ones, because the true man and woman of God is going to teach justification by faith. Come on, amen? Are you with me so far? In every religion, and I mean every religion out there, and there are almost 4,000 some religions out there, and even false Christianity, like Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, Seventh-day Adventism, Roman Catholicism, they all teach that man can work his way to God. Did you know that? And you can't. Please, Ken talked about this morning. Do we understand this? Hear me. You cannot work your way to God. Jesus came down to us because we can't not get up to God. God came down to us because we cannot get up to Him. Jesus suffered on the cross as a man because, now get this, He became a man to die on that cross, suffer and die, to, so that we can be forgiven of our sins. He had to be fully God to forgive us of our sins. Exactly. Do you see this? Are we understanding this? All right? Are you with me so far? All right, so... All false Christianity teaches that Jesus came for another purpose and man can basically earn his way to God and you can't. That's why Jehovah's Witnesses go out and knock on doors. You know that? They're not knocking on doors because they're just trying to share their false faith. If they don't, they will never have a chance to make the, 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 the new earth. 
that they, they don't even know if they're going to make it. Isn't that sad? Can you imagine being in their shoes? Oh boy, I hope I hand out enough watchtowers today because I, I'm behind. And, and, and Jehovah's going to cast me out of his kingdom. That's works oriented. It's evil. It's wicked. It's of Satan. And these people are, are, are all going to go to a hell that they don't even believe in. Think about that. Do you see what I'm talking about? Mormons, same way. Teach that Jesus is not fully God. That he's the brother of Satan. And these, these different ones, they, where did they get this from? False teachers and false prophets. And, you know, to teach all, all this stuff would take me three years, four years to teach everything. But I want you to get a, a hint of what's going on. Now get this. Only in true biblical Christianity, and that's what we teach here, man is saved as a result of God's grace through faith in what Christ accomplished on the cross. Amen. It is by faith we are saved through grace through what Christ accomplished on the cross. Right? You understand it? The word justified means pronounced or treated as righteous. This is God saying, I see that you are, you accepted by faith what Christ did on the cross, what I did on the cross. Now I declare to you, you are righteous as if you never sinned. For a, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. For a Christian, justification is the act of God not only forgiving the believer's sins, but imputing to him the righteousness of Christ. And that is what Christ did for us. And that's what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.21. Right? Jesus Christ, God made Jesus who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might be what? Might be what? We might become the righteousness of Christ through him. It's so important. Do you get it? Right? Right? Yeah. I'm going to repeat that again. God made Jesus who knew no sin to be what? Sin, sin for us. Now, he didn't become a sinner because God can't sin. sin he became a sin offering. Right. That we might become the what? The righteousness of God through in him or through him. Amen. So are you with me? All right, so here we go. Boy, we're going to pick this up next week. Are you with me so far? Yeah. All right, should we stop here? No? Some of you, I don't want your eyes crossing now. Stand up and do some jumping jacks. No. No. All right, to identify the fruit of true and false prophets and teachers, understand, here it is, number one, who is Jesus Christ and what was his purpose concerning justification? Now, that's where it begins. The false prophets and teachers all teach a different Jesus. Do you understand that? Oh, it doesn't matter what Jesus you believe in, right? You know? You're, you know, if you believe in Jesus, you're saved, right? Come on, be honest with me. What Jesus are you talking about? Every religion believes in a Jesus. Did you know that Muslims believe in Jesus? Who is Jesus to the Muslim? The Son of God? No, a prophet that failed. Did you know that Hindus believe in Jesus? Who's Jesus to the Hindus? He's just one God of many. They have thousands of gods they worship. But my Bible says there's only one God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord God is one. What about the Buddhists? What do they say about Jesus? Hmm? He was just a, what you would call an enlightened one that had the truth, but he was just a man. What about the New Agers? They believe in Jesus. Same thing. He was an enlightened one. He had the truth. Just a man. You go right down the line. Mormons. Jesus was the brother of Satan. You go all the way through. Jehovah Witnesses. They believe in Jesus. What did they say? Jesus was the Archangel Michael who became a man. My Bible says he's God. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. He's God. So if you don't believe in the right Jesus, you're in trouble. Get it? Jesus clearly said, if you do not believe that I am he, you will what? Die in your sins. Get this down. So who is Jesus Christ and what was his purpose in, 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 in concerning justification? Here it is. For the Son of Man is come to what? Seek and to save the lost. We're going to stop here in just a second because we'll pick this up. We're talking about justification. We'll, we'll, we'll go deeper next week. Justification and sanctification. But what did Jesus come for? He came to seek and to save the lost sinner. He didn't come to seek and to save the poor person to make him rich. He didn't come to seek and to save the sick person to make them healthy. 
Oh, wait a minute, Pastor. Jesus healed a lot of people. Yeah, yeah, he did, but why did he do that? Why did he do that? Let me ask you this. Why did he walk on water? Was that to show off? I mean, that's pretty cool if you don't think about it, to get out of a boat and walk on water. Come on. Why did he raise the dead, such as Lazarus? Was he showing off? What was he doing? What was he doing? He was proving who he said he was. God. All right? He proved. No one did the miracles like Jesus did. Amen? False prophets and teachers will say they have the same ability as Jesus, yet I don't see them doing anything like Jesus did. Come on. I have been to those so-called healing Cam uh, campaigns by these word of faith teachers and they're, they're false prophets and teachers and they'll declare someone healed and they may have uh, feel better but oftentimes they don't get healed. Now I'm not saying God can't heal. I believe God can heal. And I pray for people to get healed. But guess what? If God heals it's because he desires to do it not because I confessed it or said God has to do it. Amen. Amen. But see th this is the problem. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. So let's say, for instance, we have people come to church and I'm praying, we're praying for people to be healed of their sickness. And let's say God heals them. But what happens if they're not saved? What good was it for God to heal them? What if we prayed for someone to get a job? We have a lady come in and say, oh, I, I'm struggling to pay my bills. And we pray and she gets a good job, a six-figure income, and she makes a lot of money. What good is it if she makes a lot of money and is not saved? You're not going to stay healed your whole life. You're getting older, and please don't tell me you can walk in divine health. That's a false teaching. I have been around these people. Your body is getting older and weaker. Like I said, I didn't have to wear these 10 years ago. I hate them. I do. But I have to see, oh, now you guys look really good. You're blurry. Looking good. Okay, but what I'm trying to say is this. What, is the per what did Jesus come for? What is it? Say it. He came to save the lost. Come on. And that's the gospel. It's all about what Jesus did on the cross. Look at Jesus said in Luke 5, 31, 32. Let's stop here. And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. Who is he referring to? The physically sick? The spiritually sick. I came not to call the righteous... Those who think they are saved, but the sinners to repentance. Amen? All right? Praise God. Now, 1 John 4, 1. I've got to get this in. We'll pick it up next week. Here it is. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. What's John talking about? What kind of spirit? Well, there's two kinds of spirits. There's the Holy Spirit that's working in the man, woman of God. And there are many evil spirits that work in the false prophets and teachers. The Spirit is what motivates them. The true Holy Spirit motivates the man, woman of God to speak truth. Why? To what? To bring people to Jesus. For what? That they may be saved. That's it. To bring men and women that sinners to, to Christ that they may be saved. To bring the saved. Who's saved here today? Okay, so you don't need to be saved, but what you do need is to be sanctified. So the true man or God is going to speak truth that you get the truth in you so you can become more like Jesus. There it is. All right? It's not about money. Please. A true man or God cares about the people. They care about the sinner to be saved. They care about the saved to walk with Jesus. Why? Because they love the people. Now, you, you, you take this, the, the, the one who has the false spirit, because... The false man, the, the false prophet, false teacher, what do they want? They want money. They want you to come to their church because I, I want more money. They want to please you. They want to tell you things that's all to make them to get, gain more. So here it is. We've got to close with this. So I'm, I'm starting to, you know, stumble over my words. But do not believe every spirit, spirit, but test the spirits. Notice, test the spirits. What spirit? What's going on here? What's motivating? Whether they are of God or not. Because many false prophets have gone out in the world. Many. Now get this. 1 John 4, 2 through 3. By this you know the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, and every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. This is so important. The man or woman who's preaching the truth, who's motivated by the Holy Spirit, proclaims who Jesus really is. Who is Jesus? He is God. 
He is God in the flesh. He came in human form. For, for what? To suffer on the cross. Why? Because we're all sinners and we need a Savior. And therefore, he also preaches how to be saved. We must repent, believe on Jesus Christ. Amen. All right? Jesus is not only God who suffered on the cross. He is the truth. And we proclaim the truth of God's word. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. Anyone who says that Jesus was just a good man, a good prophet, or he was God, but he stopped being God and suffered on the cross and went to hell. Oh, that's another teaching. How many have heard it? Christ suffered in hell for our sins. Who teaches that? Come on, say it. Copeland, Joyce Myers, Jesse DeBlanis. All the Word of Faith preachers that in hell Jesus suffered for our sins. I got news for you. That's not true at all. When Jesus hung on that cross, he said, it is finished when he died. All right. That means he paid the price in full. Where did he go then? Did he go into hell? He went to Hades. Paradise. Who did he preach to? The spirits. He wasn't suffering in hell. There's no scriptures that teach that. He went down and preached to the spirits. And he, even the spirits, the evil spirits, said, I've got the keys of death in Hades. It's over. Right. It's over. I have one. Come on. Are you getting it? Yes. He had to be there for three days to prove he was really dead. Come on. Right. Otherwise, they'd say, oh, if an hour or two. He could have done that an hour or two. But no, three days. And that's what the scriptures say. He would be. The Son of Man would be in the heart of the earth for three days, just like Jonah was in the, the belly of a whale. Come on. Are you with me? All right. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God, and this is the spirit of who? The Antichrist. Now get this. Once again, what does that have to do with it? The Antichrist is what? Against Christ and instead of Christ. So you've got a different Jesus here. You've got a different Jesus. Against Christ and instead of Christ. And this is the spirit of Antichrist, which you heard it was coming, is now already in the world. Amen. All right, so praise the Lord. Let's stop here. Now, what are the three words? Justification, which means we are saved by God's grace through faith for what Christ did on the cross, who is Jesus Christ. He is God in the flesh who suffered God's wrath. Please don't say he just suffered on the cross and died. Well, I got news for you. A lot of people suffered on the cross and died. Jesus was not the only one to ever be crucified. What made Jesus cry out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He felt God's wrath for you and I. The penalty for our sins was paid. So we know that salvation is only through Christ and Him crucified. Amen? That's justification by faith. Jesus is the way. All right? We'll stop here because we're going to talk about... Yes, we have... Yes, absolutely. And we want you to ask questions. That's how we learn. Yep. No, there comes a time where you have to wipe the dust off your feet and go. Right, but what if they're related? Do you still gather with them? Or sure. Them? Treat them family. Oh. They just don't. The Bible says that we are not to what? We are not to be unequally yoked with the unbelievers. What that, does that mean? That means we are going along with them. Oh, yeah. Because so, you, you work with the unbelievers. You don't treat them like dirt. You, you, you still want to show them Christ by your lifestyle. Right. Be loving. Be compassionate. They may not want to hear what you have to say, but still show them love. Because that might make a, 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 a little bit of a doorway for you to get that truth in, right? And, and another thing is, like, I had quite a few things put in my path, like, really weird, like, just odd. Um, I had sought a, um, a median, um, mm -hmm. not median, the other one, same a, thing. A, a fortune like teller? Years ago. A soothsayer? Yes. Be careful there. No, 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 no. This was this was three mm -hmm. years ago, okay. three all right. and a half years ago. Right. But it all of a sudden she emailed me and I was able to um, tell her like everything I eat, a rebuke it and everything like that. Of course she didn't answer me back, but hopefully that but what happens with a person that is not actually out in the world, they're elderly, they don't have like family to witness to, they don't have like like how is anything even put 
You mean like a, a family member that doesn't get out around family? Not a family member, just a, a person that, that, that the Holy Spirit, there's no one to really put in your path because. And that's sad because, you know, actually the church needs to be reaching out to those people if we know where they're at. Send them materials. You know, if anything, send them a track. Go pray with them. Bring them something. Maybe they want, need something. Ask them what they need. And that's a ministry. Right? We want to do that. So if you know somebody like that, let us know because we can reach out to them, you know. But so, especially an elderly person who doesn't get out and doesn't know anybody and is lonesome. That is sad. But Jesus wants us to visit the widows, right? And to, to minister to them. Amen. Yes, we have a comment over here. Yes. That's a good question. Thank you. Well, I believe he went down and he preached to the ones that uh, Abraham's bosom, Lazarus was there, um, all the Old Testament saints were there, all those who put their faith in God's uh, promise. But I also believe he preached in, uh, to the, uh, saint, the, the uh, demonic spirits. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. Uh, because you got, uh, at that same place, you have two spots. You got the upper Hades and lower Hades. <coughs> the lower Hades is where... Um, the rich man went, and that's also a place where these spirits are being held, these evil spirits, these angels. And Jesus went down and said, you know, uh, I, it's over. The end game is over. I've won. Yeah. So all Satan is doing right now is trying to hold on to be the God of this world. So we'll do a teaching on that sometime, but we definitely know Jesus did not suffer in hell because he didn't need to. Right. And there's a reason why they teach that. They don't just teach it because they think, well, it sounds like it. They have to teach that because the word of faith is a false... Christian movement. Is they're, they're, they're no more saved than a Jehovah Witness because they believe that Jesus suffered in hell as a man so we can take upon God's um, we can become little gods. We can take upon who God is. How does that say, Ken? You, you were part of it. Yeah. You were part of it. What did they teach you? They teach us we're little gods. We're teaching little gods. And that's why they teach that they don't tell you to pray for your um, needs. You confess your needs. Because you, just, you have just as much power to create with your faith-filled words right. as God does. And you don't. You don't. Please, that's a lie. This is, it's called, you know, where it started with, it started with Christian science. Right. It's a metaphysical cult. Right. And, and uh, Quimby, what is his name? Phineas Quimby. Phineas Quimby took it next level. And then a, another man who was a false teacher took it from there. His, he was um, um, Kenneth Hagin. Right. You know, and oh, I, I thought he was a Christian. Oh, come on. If you're saved, who indwells you? The spirit of error? The spirit of truth. And you see, if you do your own Bible studies on these, and I encourage you to, go on YouTube. Look at why the Word of Faith movement is false. Why the New Apostolic Reformation, which is worse than the Word of Faith, is false. Now, I'm not, I didn't intend to get into all this. All right, when we put out our book, the, the, the binder we're going to put out here in a few months, called Don't Be Deceived, you're going to get all that. And you can do your own studying. But right now, I just want you to understand what true biblical salvation is. Amen? Amen. All right? Praise God. Right? Amen. Yeah. And, and Ken, one of these days, we're going to get you to get up and preach a message why, why you came out of the Word of Faith. Because he had all these books and tapes and everything. Well, they're in the trash now. Yeah, yeah. They're what they need to be. They're long gone. But yeah. I want to ask Ken's question. Ken's yeah. question here. Yeah, read that. Which he also went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So he preached to the spirits in prison. These were the fallen angels. Fallen angels. That, uh, That's what all first Peter, what is that, first Peter 2? Uh, first Peter 3, verse 9. <coughs> that, that whole chapter is about that. Right. And yeah. then. And he brought him out of there, right? First, yeah, he took took the captivity captive. Right. Ephesians 4 verse, begins with verse 8. He said this. Wherefore said he, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive. Mm -hmm. See, they were once captives of Satan. They weren't, they weren't suffering in paradise. No. They were Abraham's bosom. The devil, the devil couldn't touch them. No, it's Abraham's bosom. But, but they were in Abraham's bosom. They were protected until the Savior paid the price on Calvary's cross. Amen. That's why they wanted, they, when they said, Come down from the cross and we will believe. They did. They were, I guarantee those, those 
paper, I was begging for Christ to finish the, the work on Calvary. Because if he didn't, they'd still be down there and then eternal hell. Right. Well, here's the thing you have to understand. The Bible says, Jesus said, no one can come to the Father unless I am the way, truth, and life. Right? Right. All right. So, he, uh, Jesus, when he died... We know he didn't go right to the Father because remember when he was resurrected, remember Mary went to cling with him. Remember what did he say? Don't touch me for I have not yet ascended to the Father. Exactly. All right, so, so what's going on and what, what's happening? No one can go to the Father until Jesus paid the price in full. Yeah. Yeah. And he said in verse 9, now that he ascended, what is it that he also descended into the lower parts of the earth? Mm -hmm. He who descended is the same who also ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. things yeah. Yeah. So we know that uh, wherever this is, Abraham's bosom and wherever Hades is, where all the uh, unrighteous dead are, is in the lower parts of the earth. Yeah. It makes sense, all right? Amen. All right. Brother and sister, thank you for staying long. But I'm trying to get this across. Do you understand now? What's the three words? Justification. Sanctification and glorification. We've we got to be concerned about the first two. The last one is never going to come unless you're justified. Justified by faith, right? So let's finish this up. How many here today you have accepted Christ as your Savior? You are a born-again believer. Okay. I'm going to pray that maybe someone is watching and uh, you have not come to that place. You must do so because the Bible says today is the day of salvation. That means you don't know. Tomorrow you may be dead. And if you are without Christ, you have sealed your fate. Hell is forever, friends. It's forever. And it's horrible. How can God send anybody to hell? The loving God, he doesn't want to. He doesn't want to. But he has to. Because if your sins are not paid for by Christ, there's only one other place you can go. And there is no purgatory. There's only heaven and hell. The lake of fire that we know as hell was created for Satan and all of his fallen angels. Don't join Satan there. Please. You have a chance right now, and here's what you must do. You must confess your sin. Say, Lord, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I am lost. No matter what I try to do in a million years, I'm still lost. Therefore, I'm trusting in you by faith. You paid the price for me. You are my Savior. Lord, forgive me. Grant me repentance. For I know that you took and paid the penalty. Save me from my sins. And I ask that you will help me to follow you from this day forth so that I may glorify you in Jesus' name. Do that right now. Ask God to forgive you. And he'll do it. He loves you that much. He loves you that much. Even the sinner on, on the cross, last second, said, Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He didn't even really say, Lord, forgive me. But Jesus knew what he meant. Remember me. Just remember me. I'm a terrible person. I deserve to be hung here. I deserve to be crucified, not you. And what did Jesus say? Today you shall be with me in paradise. That's how much he loves us. What a wonderful Savior. Amen. Would you stand with me? Hallelujah. I want you to sing this song as we go out the door and thank you. I just want you to learn. And this song goes like, Oh, how he loves you and me. Do you know it? Oh, how he loves you and me. He, there we go. Can, can you sing that? You know it? Amen. Oh, how he loves you and me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He paid the price. What more could he do? Oh, how he loves you. Oh, how he loves me. Oh, how he loves you and me. He gave himself. Amen. He gave himself for us to pay the price. Brother Ken.
sanctification, Lord, and we thank you for that, Lord. We didn't deserve it, but you did anyway because of your great love. And Lord, I ask you, Father, to protect us and lead us and guide us, Lord, throughout the week. Lord, put people across our 